all booked up, sorry. We don't need much. What part of I'm all booked up did you not understand? I have no room for you in my inn. Please. We've been walking for days. Do you think you were the first person to pound on my door at this hour of the night, looking for a room? There has to be something. A, a closet, perhaps. You can keep asking the same question. I'm going to give you the same answer. Why, what are you doing up? You need to rest now. We won't be any trouble. And I'll pay you whatever you want. Please. I'm, I'm sorry. No vacancies. God will provide. Hey. Give me a minute. First Christmas was pretty difficult for those young people, and um, kind of a hectic time. And maybe for you and me, it's hectic as well. I know uh, for me, it's been. I think I'm on week uh, no day 11 of being busy every night and every day. Uh, maybe you're in that same season where I, I go home and I'm like, "What is this place? Who is living here?" And it's my family, but I just you know we just don't see them very often. And it's a very busy time for all of us. We're shopping and we're doing, it's all good stuff, but we're very, 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 very busy. And that first Christmas was pretty chaotic as well. Uh, let's start in Luke chapter 2. We're going to do verses 4 through 7, and then we'll do some breakdown. Luke 2, verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. As she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Yay! So, you know, you think your situation's bad. I want you to really think about this. These are real people. Now, they had to go back to the town in which they grew up in. She's nine months pregnant. Now, I've never been pregnant. I've heard it's very difficult. No, it's not? Okay. Ladies, I thought you'd agree with me or say something like... About nine months. A little? About nine months. <laughs> About nine months of difficult. No, oh. the ninth month. Oh, the ninth month is difficult. Yeah. You know, I don't know either, John. <laughs> so, you know, we just try our best, you know. I know for my wife, she had zero emotional ups and downs. She had... <laughs> yes. I was impressed. Yeah, yeah, you're like, wow. No, I'm just kidding. It's a rough time, you know. It's a rough time. And so, imagine she's got to go back to her hometown. Uh, she's, she's riding on a donkey. A don nine months on a, uh, you know, nine months pregnant on a donkey. You have to travel about 30, 40 miles from the place you were to. I can just imagine her saying, I told you not to get this short of a donkey. But no, you had to save, you know, save some money and get the cheap donkey when you could have got the. This one's got a hitch in its giddy up. Now my back hurts. You know, we think of it all as a perfect situation. This was not a perfect situation. She gave birth in a barn. Hey, you know, don't you want your birth space to be clinically sanitized and such? There's, this is 2,000 years ago, so not a lot was clinically sanitized anyway. Imagine how a barn would have been 2,000 years ago. They're not good now. Oh, man. So we, we think it's this quaint little story. And, oh, in a manger. Man. That's the, that means the only bed they could find for this kid was a trough that they fed the pigs from and the animals from. 
Yeah, you thought your bed was lumpy. This is not the situation that they had hoped for. This is not the situation that they were shooting for. This is a, a terrible situation, and she just, you know, I'm 10 months, and then you go to your town, and she's pregnant, and now, look, there's no vacancy. Thanks, great, this is wonderful. Now, 2,000 years ago, this really happened. This story really happened, so we need to put that in the back of our heads. Caesar Augustus asked for a census. Now, when they ask for a census, they do that so they can tax you. Don't we love taxes? Oh, yes. You see your little check, and then you think, that was taken out. You know, to be nice to you, they took that out for you. Oh, thank you so much. So I don't have to pay at the end of the year. You just take it out a little at a time. Whew, there's one less thing. But then you start doing the math on that number, like, wait a minute. Taxes stunk 2,000 years ago, and they still stink today, right? Government bureaucracy stunk 2,000 years ago, and it still stinks today. They would do the census every 14 years so they could make sure they got every penny out of you that they needed to get out of you. Yeah. Yay. Not only that, you had to go uh, back to the place you were born to do the census. Now, I was born in Lafayette, Indiana. Anybody here born someplace else besides Plymouth? Yeah? Okay. Wow, everywhere else. Somebody give me some, some strange places that you were born uh, besides Plymouth. Memphis, Tennessee. Urbana, Illinois. Illinois, what Illinois? Urbana, Illinois. Urbana, Illinois. Yeah, Everett, Washington. Everett, Washington. Chicago, Oregon, Illinois. Oregon, Illinois. Yes. Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Gary. Gary. Uh, smart. You're, you're here. What, somebody had a different country? Spain. Spain. The rain in Spain? Mainly on the plane, is that that's what I've heard. No? Okay. Anybody else? Imagine having to go back to Spain to pay your taxes. Boy, that would be lovely. Or Oregon, Illinois, which is a place so confused it doesn't know what state it's in. It's in the state of confusion. That was original, yeah. It's off the top of my head, man. Oh thanks. Uh, you know, not only do you have to pay your taxes, you got to go back to the place you were born at. I got to go to Lafayette. You got to go all over the place, Memphis, Tennessee. We, I mean, I mean, just because government bureaucracy, they just got to make it a little more difficult on you. Yeah. So Joseph is exactly what he does. He goes back to Galilee, but God had a plan. In the middle of all of the chaos of the story, God had a plan. And in the middle of your chaos of your story, God too has a plan. It's not on accident. It's on purpose. In Micah, uh, in Old Testament, Micah 5, 2, here is the prophecy about Christ being born in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephaphra, Ephra, Hathra, <laughs> though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from, from me, for me, one who will be rule over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, it is understood, even today, when Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they do believe the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. They do believe that. Matter of fact, it's really hard in Judaism to negate the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. So hard that in modern Judaism, they believe they have two Messiahs because they can't just be one person because somehow this person's from Galilee and from Bethlehem. Well, Jesus was that. And they actually call him Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David because he has to be the son of Joseph and the son of David. That can't be one person unless it's Joseph and the son of David, just like Jesus was. So they literally have two messiahs because they can't get it all to line up right with the one messiah that we already know came. Now, if you're wondering what it's like, there's eight, uh, if you just took eight, excuse me, there's more than that, it's about 20. If you just took eight of the prophecies of the Old Testament about the messiah and, and looked at the odds of those coming to pass, here's what those odds look like. It's one in the 100 quadrillion that all those things lined up and it actually lined up with Jesus. We were like, that's a big, that's a big number. Yeah, you, you have no idea. Here's how big that one in 100 quadrillion is. If you take a silver dollar and you put a silver dollar over the entire state of Texas and you put so many silver dollars that it's two foot thick and you mark one and then you fly randomly over the state of Texas, cram your hand into the two feet thick of silver dollars Bring one out, and you bring out the one you mark. Those are one. That's one in one hundred quadrillion chances. 
and all the stuff lined up from Jesus just like it lined up. Isn't that awesome? Huh? Isn't that amazing? See, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're putting your faith in the truth. Statistical truth. You're putting your faith in the truth. So the place was full. There's no vacancy. The hung on the local end door. No room available for them. This is not the story they wished they had planned. In 1998, my wife and I had a vacation given to us to, to go to a ski resort, a skiing vacation. And uh, it was awesome. Um, so back in the day, you know, you didn't have GPS or anything like that. You didn't have no smartphones. You didn't even have a phone. Like you drove down the road without a phone. You know? <laughs> so uh, we get in our car. We're going to Midway Airport. No, excuse me. We're going to O'Hare Airport, catch our flight, uh, Chicago to Denver, you know, do our thing. So we're all dressed up in our ski, this cold, you know, dressed up in our ski stuff, get in the car, start going up there. Now, back in the day, I was confused because Chicago's got 80, 94, 90, 94, 92, 94, 99, 94. It's got 80s and 90s and a lot of 94s and 80s and 90s in there. And if you're not careful, you'll take the wrong 80, 90, 94, 294. take the wrong you take the wrong one of those. Back before the beautiful voiced woman tells me where to go. Not my wife, the other one. So... So we, uh, I got lost. I, got, I went down the wrong one. And so after, man, after, it was quite a while, I actually did have to ask for directions. <laughs> and I was going the wrong way. I had to turn around. I had to turn around, go this other way, go down this other interstate. Okay. So I started looking at my watch, and I'm realizing, hey, man, this is getting close. It's getting real close. Uh oh. So uh, pull up into there, and then you got to park in the long term parking when you do that kind of thing, because I'm leaving my car there the whole week. And that's like, uh, what, 250 miles away from where you have to go, actually? So I grab up our stuff, and we're walking to the thing. I, Come on, baby, we got to hurry. So I get to the, uh, the, the, the first counter where the people helped you. Back in the day, you didn't have a computer. You had a person that actually helped you. Yeah, I know, it's awesome. And you didn't have to go through every kind of uh, <laughs> TSA. Whatever. Yeah, I had a whole bunch of other words coming to me. It's like, that, can't use that one. Can't use that one. Can't use that one. Okay, so that's what was just going on in my head right there. Uh, so I go, I go up there and I got my boarding pass. I go, okay, and, and the guy, the guy grabs up my, grabs up my thing. He looks at it, goes, run. <laughs> that's what he said. Okay, so. We grab up my wife and I'm like, go baby! And so we start running. We know it's like the other side of the terminal. And uh, those of you who've been O'Hare, you have to go down and there's like the one with the cool lights to go above your head. Okay, so we're running and we're running and running. She's like, I'm tired. And she was pregnant with Hagen. I'm like, you gotta run, baby. You gotta run. Come like, on, oh, baby. She's like, I don't wanna go no more. We gotta go. I don't even know why we were running. But I wouldn't run now. I'd be like, too bad. <laughs> I'm on the little scooter thing that scoots me itself, you know. <laughs> However fast this thing's going, it's how fast I'm going. We're running, we're running, we're running. We get to the, uh, we get to the gate finally. We show up the gate. I got my, I got my thing. She got her thing. We're just drenched in sweat because we were wearing the, the ski clothes, you know. And she's, and she made it. We're just, <sighs> and we handed over our boarding pass. She goes, well, I need to see your ID. Yeah. My ID, my ID. Where, I swear I have my ID. No ID. I have no driver's license. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I see the same guy that told me to run, and he himself is running with our driver's licenses in his hands. Man, it's like that O.J. Simpson commercial from a long time ago, except he's not a mass murderer. And he's running with the, he's running with the things, and he hands me my driver's license, and we go, here's what I am, yeah, I get on the plane, and we basically passed out. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. God makes everything all right in the end. Somehow, some way, he takes your tragedy, he takes your situation, and he spins it around, and he makes everything all right in the end. And in this story, of course, we have this poor little family going through all they're going through, but God turns around and makes it, he makes it all right. Now, this innkeeper, we don't know a whole lot about him, except for what the Bible says, but it's not good. Right? I mean, he's not, it's not a good story. He's got, a, he's got an end, but he's got no room for the Messiah. In, uh, in 1775, excuse me, 1785, Thomas Jefferson comes to a 
a hotel in Baltimore. And he's, he just got done working in the field. He's dressed, you know, in his farmer fatigue. He does not look like, at the current time, he's the vice president of the United States. And he goes to this inn, uh, this hotel no, uh, uh, owned by Mr. Boyden. And Mr. Boyden says, I'm sorry, sir. We don't, we don't do a four-star hotel. You, you've got this dirty farm clothes on. We don't, we don't serve your type. So he walks out and he goes to another hotel and they take him in, of course. And Mr. Borden finds out he just said no to the vice president of the United States. <laughs> Filled with apologies, he sends over a couple of the representatives from his hotel to, uh, to you know, oh, we're so sorry, Mr. Vice President. We, we, did, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't realize who you were. And Thomas Jefferson, being the very witty person that he is, he's got a quote. He says, tell Boyden that if he has no room for a dirty farmer, he has none for the vice president of the United States. That's back when our government was represented by people like, like us. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> I know, I did it like two hours there. <laughs> but Mr. Boyden goes down in history as the guy who doesn't have room for the vice president of the United States. And this innkeeper goes down in history as the one who doesn't have room for the Messiah. You guys remember Michael Jordan? The greatest basketball player in the history of all basketball, right? Yep. Back when the NBA mattered. <laughs> yeah, you know it. There's three, there's three rings, of course, you know, the three, three times they won the, the national championship. Even in North Carolina, he won the national championship. But in high school, he was cut from the varsity team. The coach didn't see the potential in him. Now, you don't want to be the coach who doesn't see the potential in Michael Jordan, do you? I Googled this. I couldn't find this coach's name. I think they, like, struck in it from all the Internet. Like, Wikipedia, like, this guy was getting death threats or something. Like, man, you got to put him in, like, protective custody. FBI underground stuff. Because he didn't see the potential. And that's kind of this innkeeper, too. He didn't realize what was going on. But, for, friends, we can get so busy in the Christmas season that we forget what's going on that we get the cart before the horse. We get the innkeeper being more important than the Messiah coming to the inn. We fill our lives up with Christmas stuff, but we don't realize the reason for the Christmas season is actually Jesus, and we leave him out of all those other Christmas things we do. Let's not be those friends today. Now, the innkeeper is one of two things. He was either unaware that the Messiah was going to come to Bethlehem, and that represents in our society, of course, people that are unaware that Jesus lives and is coming back again. They're going through their life. They're just doing their end. They're so busy with all their other stuff, they don't have time for God. Or the innkeeper didn't care. He's either unaware or didn't care. Think about that one. He didn't care. He looks out there, sees the nine-month pregnant year, pregnant, and just goes, too bad. I got no room. Hey, I'll sleep on the floor. Nope. Out in the barn if you want. I don't care. I mean, think about that. We have a person who was unaware or he didn't care and had no compassion. Busy thinking about himself. He's got these people coming in from the census. He's got money to make. He's got priorities now that are higher than the priority of the people that are right around him. And when we do that, friends, we, we, we miss the opportunities that God's got for us. When we're so busy being the coach of the high school team, sometimes we miss the opportunities of the Michael Jordans on the team. When we're running around with the inn and we, da -da -da, we miss the opportunities of connecting with Jesus or connecting with the people God's got for us because we're too busy doing good things, but they're not what God wants us to do. Now, our nation, too, has no vacancies symbolically, guys. There's no nation symbolically. America has found itself without a place for God. On the top of the Washington Monument is a, is a, a aluminum triangle, not pyramid, that has the words in it, praise be to God. It has some other words, da, 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 here's what God has done, praise be to God. Laus Dio, it has it in Latin, praise be to God. But you know, in 2007... They, they have another replica of it at the bottom, a museum at the bottom. In 2007, they, they took the replica of it and they spun it around so you couldn't see those words, praise be to God, anymore. Not only that, they had the big poster that says, here's what's written on the top of the Moss Washington Monument. You can't see it because you're not 300 foot tall, but this is what you would see. And at the bottom, they erased the words, 
Praise be to God. By the way, it's 2007, that's a Bush administration. We want to get real political here. They took the, because we just don't want to offend anybody anymore. We got holiday trees, holiday break, Kwanzaa, holiday programs, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Christmas time. <laughs> you know. But in America, we can't say Merry Christmas at the stores, you know. It's like you don't want to offend anybody because there's no vacancy in our nation for God anymore. But let's think about our own families, guys. We need to put Jesus back into our families. Because America's going to have a lot of people giving Christmas gifts away this season. They're going to have Christmases and they're going to have gifts and it's going to be all good, all those kinds of things. Yeah, that's all great. They're going to have trees. They're going to eat. They're going to have celebrations. But you know what? Where is Jesus in the middle of this? Friends, I'm telling you right now, we need to put Jesus back in the middle of that celebration. Read Luke chapter 2. Luke 2. That's all you have to remember. Luke 2. Read Luke chapter 2 as a family before you open your presents. Just a suggestion. I'm not that thou shalt command thee die. I'm just saying, what about injecting Jesus back into the situation? It'd be like having a birthday party for Heath, but we didn't invite Heath. I come stumbling in here. What's going on? Hey, man. We're having a birthday party. Really? Whose birthday is it? It's yours? Really? You guys all gave each other presents? That's nice. Like, what about a present for me? Oh, we don't have no time for you, man. We're celebrating your birthday. Okay. That's what we do to Jesus every December here in America. Let's put him back and inject him back into the situation. Amen? So what about you today? Do we have room in our own hearts for Jesus? I know for me, I've really been feeling convicted that I'm doing a lot of good Christmas things, but I'm not praying like I need to be and spending time with God like I need to be. I'm doing good Christmas stuff. And I'm connecting with people, and that's all beautiful, but what about Jesus in the middle of this situation? Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is Jesus in the book of Revelation speaking. Here I am, I stand at the door, and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he will eat with me. Here I am, I'm standing at the door, and I'm knocking. God is at the door of our hearts. Jesus is at the door of our hearts, and he's saying, let me in to your family this Christmas. Let me in to your personal heart this Christmas. You see, it's not just enough to let him in one time when we all became Christians. That's good. But it's much more important that we let him in every single day. Start out every single morning and say, here I am, Jesus. Come on into my life. Let's walk through today together. Me and you, Lord. Let's do this together, Jesus. Now, there's a famous painting by Holman Hunt called Light of the World. I think we got a picture over here. It's a famous painting. You got Jesus here and the sun's going down, which is representing uh, death. Uh, and here at Jesus, the, the, the king, knocking on the door. Now, if you look around this door, you see there's uh, grown-up foliage and stuff. This door has not been opened in a very long time. It's a beautiful picture about people's hearts. But Holman Hunt, when he painted this in 1853, he, uh, he brought over a friend of his that was also a painter and said, what do you think of this painting? And the friend of his, uh, his was like, this is, this is great. And he said, I understand here that the sun's going down and, and all the... Uh, the, the, the things that he's trying to portray here in the picture. But then he said, oh, wait, wait, Holman, you, you forgot one important thing. You didn't, put a, you didn't put a knob on the door. You didn't put a way to open. He said, no, that's on the inside only. Friends, we are the only ones that can open the door. Jesus cannot open the door to your heart. Only we can open the door of our hearts. There's no knob on the outside. He cannot force his way in. He refuses to force his way in. Instead, friends, we've got to open the door and let him into our life. And that's a decision for you and me that we've got to make every single day, every single morning. Jesus, I'm opening my heart to you. Even today, right now, Jesus, we're opening our heart to you. Come be with us, Lord. My application slide for us today. Remember that miracles usually come at the end of very difficult times. Make Jesus a part of your family Christmas traditions and open your heart to Jesus every single morning. The first one there, remember miracles come at the very end of very difficult times. If we didn't have a difficult time, we couldn't have a miracle. And the miracles come at the end of our difficult times. He was born in the manger under very stressful situations. 
Remember, make Jesus a part of your family Christmas traditions. Start some new traditions this year that have Jesus in them. Amen? Amen. Tell your kids about the Christmas story. Tell them, hey, we have all these good gifts, but these are coming from Jesus. Jesus has been good to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, Santa's okay or whatever, but let's make sure we tell them about Jesus too. I'd hate for our kids, seven, six, seven, eight-year-old, to know about Santa but not know about Jesus. Beware more aware of a fictional character than they are about a real one. Let's open our hearts to Jesus every single morning, friends. Every single day. I know that's what I'm going to try to do. Jesus, let's, I'm not going to celebrate your birthday and not invite you to the party. I'm going to make sure that Jesus, you are the center of attention this Christmas season. Amen. If I could have every head bowed, please, and every eye closed at this time. I want to pray. And friends, I'm praying this because a lot of it is something in my own heart right now. That I have been too busy, not too busy, I have been, un, my priorities have not been aligned correctly. And I'm going to change that in Jesus' name. And if you're wanting to change that with me, then we're going to pray today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Lord, we come before you right now, Jesus, asking for your spirit to help us. Lord, we're sorry for getting so busy that we've forgotten about you that we put other things as a priority and not you. That, Lord, we're giving presents to family, and those are all good things, Lord, but we're not giving anything to you. So, Jesus, I'm asking right now for you to forgive us. Lord, forgive us for putting other things first and more important than you are. Lord Jesus, I ask you to be with us right now. And that, Lord, every single morning we wake up and we put you as the priority. And we put you first. And we decide to walk through our lives with you, Lord Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, we're so in need of you. We pray that you help us slow the season down. We put you back where you belong. At the fourth place of our heart and of our life. That nothing else be more important than you. That nothing else take more time, that nothing else have more of, of our heart than you do, Jesus. We pray these things in your precious name, in the name of Jesus. Amen.